Hi, and welcome to the Now Spinning Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston. And in this week's episode, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me guitarist Greg Hart from the rock, pop, metal band, Cats in Space. So thank you for joining me today, Greg. So how are, how are you today? Yeah, pleasure. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you very much. Um, all good, all good. I've had a busy morning so far because I've been doing some Zooms with Australia. Which is, oh, wow. Uh, which is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's been good. It's been good. Yes, one so it's good to be back in, back in the UK. I'm down. I'm down here in Cornwall, so um, the time difference should be minimal. Oh, good. That's <laughs> that's much better. Yeah, much better. Now you've got a new album out called Kickstart the Sun, and a new single recently released called One Million uh, Miles. But before yeah. I look at that, I want to go back a bit to the beginning. How did you come up with the name Cats in Space? <laughs> um, yes, as well documented. Basically, in a nutshell, we just wanted something that was going to be different from the usual kind of names that um, rock bands have. Tend to go. Yeah, I mean, rock bands all tend to carry the same kind of names, you know. And it's like it, there's so many millions of bands out there; it's hard to think of something that's going to stick out. So, um, me and Stevie Bacon, um, drummer, and my co-partner in the band, we were just nattering one day, and one of my cats had just died. And it, one of his cats had just died. Right. And we and we're big cat lovers. You know, we, I'm, I'm a huge cat cat lover. Uh, and he said something about our cats up there in space, looking down on us, going, "Look at those silly sods, you know, doing what they're doing, getting all upset, blah blah blah." And this cats in space thing stuck. I went, "That'd be a dreadful name, or be a brilliant name." But either way around it, people won't forget it. So it's a very much a marmite thing. So we just, and bearing in mind, don't forget back then, we was only going to do one album. It was one album, Cats in Space, then we'd carry on with our lives as as planned, you know. Because it was going and to be so like a, sorry, it was going to be like a studio project, wasn't it? Was that, it was, it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was purely a, a, an itch that I had to scratch, as someone once said, and it was just going to be a, a, a collection of songs that I wanted to write over my writing partner, Mick Wilson, who was in 10CC at the time. Yeah. And we just said, let's just do something purely egotistical for ourselves um if no one likes it don't care if people like it hurrah but it was it, there was no master plan not not at all it wasn't even going to be out on vinyl it's just going to be you know a cd then i kind of thought well, it'd be nice to do vinyl just for a laugh you know but so the cats in space thing it didn't matter it was just this you know Steve did a cat pod with the ears and the visor and we saw that i went that is amazing i said that could sell that that yeah. thing there could be our Iron Maiden Eddie mascot. And as we all know, <laughs> they're not shy of a few bob when it comes to selling merchandise with Eddie on it, you know. Absolutely. I, I said, That's a really winning thing we've got there. And it was. You know? So we said, oh, Cats in Space. So it's a Marmite name. People love it or hate it, but they don't forget it. And, then, and most people nowadays call us cats anyway. And they go, oh, we're going to see cats. You know, and we always had this little thing saying if the band did ever go anywhere, People will abbreviate it to cats like they do Def Leppard. They go Leopard, yeah, Maiden, yeah. Purple, Zeppelin, yeah, you know, ELO, not Electric Light Orchestra. You know, they tend to bre- abbreviate it. So it was a win win. You know, some of the people hate our name, some of the press people don't like it. You know, some of the rock fraternity don't like it because they're all too stuffy. But I, I, th- I think, I think yeah. it's one of the best names ever. Um, and also, of course, really? having a name like Cats in Space meant that you had a domain name that no one else would have. So, exactly. You know. <laughs> That's a good point because when we first, again, we was going, well, we're going to get a website. You know, there's no one's going to have a website. Actually, there was a Cats in Space website where it's just pictures of cats in space, you know. But, <laughs> but yeah, and – that's the thing. It's like you said, you love the name. People really, really love it, or they think it's stupid. But I said, yeah, but you always remember it. So but I, think, I think it's All because, one, yeah, once you start to get under the bonnet, under the fur, and get into the music, then you understand really? how the name kind of goes with, with what you're about, really. Um, exactly. So when you first got the band together, you've got Stevie Baker and Dean Howard, of course, who'd, who'd been into Pow and played Gillen mm-hmm. and Bad Company, Jeff Brown, Andy Stewart, and Paul Manzi, originally a vocalist. Was it easy to find the members of the band when you first put the first album together? Well, that, again, that's the spooky thing. It was me and Mick was doing the demos. Mr. Heartache was predominantly just me and him with a drum machine, and it sounded yeah. really good, you know. And, it, and in fact, Mr. Hartake was never going to be on the first album. It was a Mick Wilson song for what was his second solo album, 
which ended up not coming out for many, many years. Mr. Heartache was put on Too Many Gods quite late in the day. You know, it, it was quite bizarre. But when, it, just it, again, I, I go on about this a lot, but it was a, a case of these kind of this hippie thing about the planets aligning. And these people were literally thrown at me. I mean, I've known Dean for many years. We always vowed one day we'd do something together because we've got on really well and he's a fantastic player. And he's my kind of player as well. I just love how he plays and we work very well together. So I gave him a call. I said, do you want to do some guitar? Oh, yeah, I'll have a bit of that, Greg. So, yeah, I'll have some of that. So he came down. Jeff, I'd known Jeff for years and years and years, but we'd never spoke. He's like, we trod the same murky paths back in the day, you know? Yeah. And But ironically, he contacted me completely out of the blue as I started the project, as it was, um, to do some gigs with him in Germany with his other oh, yeah. band. I thought that's really bizarre. See, because I'm actually looking for a bass player to do some stuff in this on this album. You're going, oh, I'm up for that. Oh, that's bizarre. So then Paul Manzi was recommended to me to Depp for my other show, my Supersonic show. And I didn't know Paul at all, but I'd, you know, I kind of met him. And so I thought, I thought, keep him on the back burner. He was a brilliant, he was an amazing singer. And he's been with me for donkey's years. Me and Andy Stewart have been together since 1982, since we were kids, you know. Um, yeah. And Stevie, we'd known each other for a few years at this point that were really good buddies. And we kept saying, one day we'll do a band together. One day we'll do a band together. But I'm too busy at the moment. You know, it, These people fell into my lap, literally in the studio with my engineer Ian Capel. Um, and they all came in and played on the album. But they never, we never played together as a band until we shot the video for Mr. Heartache and Unfinished Symphony, I think it was. Oh, incredible. Um, that was the first time all six of us were in a room together. We all sat around having a cup of tea and talking and catching up <laughs> on the music business. And I said, there's a chemistry here. And there is, there's, there is a magic between us. It's, I know it's corny, but there really is. And for all our little furballs and, you know, annoying habits that we all have that everyone hates you know we just played really well together you know easily the best chemistry that i've ever had ever in any band i've ever been and that's not dissing my other bands no no i know what you mean this this was super special you know and yeah. also jeff who's an amazing lead singer paul was an amazing lead singer and i could do all the city high stuff so we had three strong voices that could do the stuff on the album so it yeah, it was a it was a very lucky formula, really. You also must have had some really fantastic contacts because obviously you've got 2015 with too many gods, and then Scarecrow in 2017, and you you were able to get on support slots with Status Quo, Thunder, Deep Purple. I mean, that must have put you out in front of a lot of people very quickly. Yes, it did. I mean, 2017 was a freak year, as we've always said. It was a completely freak year. Um, we 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 had we 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 gave our album to Danny Bowes from Thunder, yeah. Who, who Dean knew. I'd, I'd never met Danny at that point, and Dean knew Danny really well from school. They, they go way back, and he goes, "Danny, listen to this album that I've just been involved with. You know, see what you think." He just went, "You're either absolutely bonkers," he said, "or you're geniuses, and I don't know which one you are yet." <laughs> so we went and had a meeting with him, and you know, it took a few months to line up, and then we had a few other people that came on board that saw us play a few gigs, and um, we were lucky enough to get um, Neil Warnock, who's one of the biggest agencies you know in the world, interested, and. By pure fluke at that time, we knew Thunder were going out on tour, so we managed to blag that tour. But that wasn't a given. People would think we got that because because of Danny, but it wasn't. It still had to go through the the machine, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then then we found out that Deep Purple was touring, and we was offered the open slot with Deep Purple in Europe. And then Status Quo came out. Wow. And they were and they weren't going to do electric at that point. They were going to do an acoustic tour. Yeah, but yeah. it was it wasn't going down well with the fans because Rick had just died. So they switched to electric but didn't have a support band. And we managed to go straight from Deep Purple and the it's following well. week we were doing status quo. And we did Hyde Park in the summer with Phil Collins and Blondie and Mike and the Mechanics and that kind of stuff. I mean, it was a crazy year. And we were told, you'll never get another year like that. That was a freak year. So it stood us in good stead. But obviously the way things have worked out since we've – you know, lineup changes, and then we had uh, COVID and that stuff. 
the whole business changed and we lost a lot of traction. Um, but yeah, that that was an incredibly good year. But it did stand us in good stead because most of our fan base emanates from what we did with Thunder. To be fair. But also, the, you're building up the albums in 2018. You got Day Trip to Narnia, which is one of my favourite albums um, from you, and um, sure. which obviously you, you supported um, Bonnie Tyler at the London Palladium, which is a great yeah. venue. Now, when I listen to you, now I'm going to read out some bands now, and I and this is just what I personally hear. I mean, obviously, you're Cats in Space, but obviously I can hear elements of Queen, especially in you know some of the guitar. Um, Twin lines, etc. ELO, especially <laughs> yeah. kind of the discovery uh, out of the blue kind of period. Cheap yeah. trick, yeah. I can, I can yeah. bits of sticks, yeah. Kansas uh, pilot, uh, that band. I can Good hear cool. bits of them. Good Ten cool. CC, obviously. Um, oh, there, there's there, you know some great um kind of um, pop from there i can hear obviously bits of you are heap and new england because of the the, the singing but the, one of the bands that I, I automatically went to was a band called city boy i don't know if you remember them i know city boy very yeah. well indeed yes yeah and um, well <laughs> just, Mutt, well, Mutt lang you know Mutt lang Mike yeah. Slayman, you know yeah. i mean I, I was a huge when they did 5705 yeah i was a huge fan and i and the funny thing was it was Bizarre because that album that's 1978 that came out. It was the same year that Mutt Lang also did Boomtown Rats. Yeah. So there was this like Rat Trap 5705 sound yeah. going on. I thought, who the hell is producing this stuff? You know, and it, this was like huge. And of course, it was Mutt Lang who then went and did all the stuff that he's done since. So yeah, I was a big City Boy fan. Davey Earth Fire is a working. Yeah, video. yeah. So I can I can pick up that as well, but also. I can also feel, and this might seem an odd thing to say, but almost like musical theatre in, in what yeah. you do. Yeah. yeah this, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we I mean Andy Stewart comes from musical theatre. Yeah. Um, um and although you know, I you know I'm the primary writer, if you like, um, I also have a lot of people don't believe this, but I actually do have a, a quite a big kind of um affection for musical theatre. Not not all that lame Miz stuff. That's not my bag at all. But there's a lot of bits and bobs like Wicked and, you know, shows like that and some of the early 70s shows. I was always fascinated by how they do these massive ballads that just emote into this theatre audience. And you think, God, this is so powerful, so emotional. And it was something that only really Freddie Mercury and, and Dennis DeYoung and those kind of people yeah. could be yeah. in, the, in the rock game. Everybody else shied away from it. You know, Thin Lizzy never went down that route, and they're my favourite band of all time. You know, UFO never really went down that route. You're right, Heat did, but Queen did, and Sticks yes. did. You know, even ELO didn't, really. No, they didn't. And no, I was no. always fascinated by this humongous kind of emotional thing. And it's and it is musical theatre. You know, it's jazz hats, yeah. whatever. And, and we love all that. I love that. I think, without being long and laborious and talking forever about it, what we have found is that the the emotional stuff that we do, like the million miles and that kind of stuff, it emotes to our fan base because they're of an age now where they really do take it to heart because we're all of an age where we're starting to think about stuff like that, you know. We yeah, think totally about agree. Totally our agree. mortality, you know. We're not young kids going, let's go down Sunset Stripper and party every day, you know. We're, we're not like that anymore. Those days have gone. So we try and do stuff that, I want songs to emote, you know, I want all of our stuff to get people, you know, there, because this is where it's coming from, all our music, you know, and this is what we said from day one, they, they thought we was mad and a bit bonkers, so I said, yeah, but it's coming from here. We generally are taking this from our, our hearts, you know, and whether it's Charlie's Ego or, you know, some like, you know, Great Story Never Told or whatever, they're all coming from the right place. Um so yeah, musical theatre is a big thing, you know. But yeah, especially about things like the story of Johnny Rockets and stuff. I can imagine that being performed at the Palladium with a big production. We'd uh, love to. We'd love to do it. I mean, that's that was always that was always one of the goals that we'd love to do if, if ever the day could come that we could do that. You know, we've even as far as the billboards, we even know how to market. You know, wow. we, we, we're, yeah, we're 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 pretty good at that kind of stuff. The cat helmet is everything to do with cats in space. You can put a cat helmet in the middle of London with no wording and everyone's going to go, what the hell is that? You've, you've already sold it. Yeah. You've already got people's interest. Yeah, that's I very, mean, very true. 
It's true, yeah. I mean, I'm diversifying it. I remember back in the day, it was, I lived in London at the time, I remember driving over Hammersmith flyover and there was a massive billboard. Like back then it was all the paper ones. And all it was was a black billboard with two green eyes on it, nothing else. And I thought it was going to be for a cat food or something like that. And then every day I went past it, I noticed that the black of the eye wasn't the iris. It was actually a miniature cat with like a person. Yeah. And of course, a couple of weeks later, they just put cats. And then a couple of weeks after, I'm going, what the bloody hell is this? And <laughs> then they revealed it was going to be useful. Yeah. It's genius. And yeah. I thought we could do that with Johnny Rocket. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. But, it, but it's yeah. very nice to have all your band's names that you've that you've compared us to there. That is a very very high accolade, and we don't take that lightly. You know, we're 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 chuffed to bits that people put us in that category. I mean, if they, you know, it's I'm you know, my job is done. You know what I mean? uh, and I'll say I'll say that for anyone who's watching or listening to this later on, because I know when you start to say or oh, bands. You know, I can hear this this band and this whatever. Some people think, "Oh, right," and they start to think, "I know what this sounds like." You don't. And that there, there are elements of all those bands I've mentioned, but you are completely uniquely yourselves. Um, you know, in fact, I mean, I've mentioned some of those bands because of the way that you use harmonies and the backing vocals. Um, but actually, I would say that for what you do, you actually surpass some of the some of the you know. Bands are, are because the sheer quality, the, the, and that's why I said musical theatre is that the sheer emotion that comes out of those, the, the way that you use the studio. I was going to ask this later on that I'm thinking about when you thought it was going to be a, a studio project. Do you see the studio almost like a, an extra member of the band because you, you use it so well? You know, the, the, the orchestration, the, the harmonies, it's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. It's, um, yeah, I mean, I make no secret of it. I'm, I'm at home in the studio far more than I'm on the road. You know, I, mean, I love going on the road and I love all the kind of, you know, the, meeting the fans and, and playing the songs live. But, I, I'm, you know, I've always been a songwriter. You know, my, I've always been a song, you know, I'm a guitar player, but I'm a songwriter, you know. Um, so I'm at home in the studio and my brain goes into a different, crazy kind of Hanna-Barbera cartoon, if you will, you know. And Ian Capel, a uh, trusty engineer who's been with me for, oh, God, 1988, we first worked together. And then we kind of met up again in the early 2000s. He shares the same vision as, as indeed does Mick Wilson. So when we started this off, we just had this potential to – really, really delve into what we wanted to do and say, look, I'm not here to do a, a second-rate version of A Night at the Opera or some poor man's ELO. You know, okay, I'm not going to put myself in Jeff Lynne and Freddie Mercury's shoes. I'd never do that. If the fans think we're as good as that, then God bless them, but I'm certainly not going to say that I'm as good as that. It's not my position to do it. But I will go to the infinite detail to push and push and push our songs into a comparative, you know, I mean, when we sit down and do a new album, we don't just sit there and crack on. I sit there and we go, what are we going to do with this album? What happened last time? You know, And I say, well, whatever happens, eye on the prize, the end result has to be magnificent. As magnificent as we can make it. I'm lucky I've got guys in the band that are incredible. We've got Damien Edwards, who I will say is the greatest singer in this country. Uh, I, yeah, that's, yeah I, I'm probably going to get, well, I am going to come along downside with you on that because um, I know that that was the next album, um, Atlantis, mm. which which then became. Oh, the, astonishing. Yeah, did, I mean, yeah. how did you get involved? I know, I know the, you know, your first vocalist went off and rejoined the suite, but how did you find Damien? How did that come about? Um, Damien came down to, again, he came down to singing by the Supersonic Band years ago. Yeah. And he came along and did these gigs. <laughs> we couldn't believe what was coming out of his mouth. He was going from ridiculous falsetto. I mean, he's got an octave on top of mine, and mine goes into the, you know, the, the heavens sometimes. Um, but he's got, he can sing as low as Scott Walker. You know, he's got this incredible <laughs> range. And I've, I, I ask him all the time, I said, how do you do what you do? Because one, you do it quickly. Two, you do it like you've been singing it forever. And, and three, the, the sheer quality of it and the accuracy and the timing and the emotion that yeah. you put into anything, it's, it, it's, it's not normal. You know? And he hates, <laughs> he hates me for doing this because he doesn't like having accolades thrown at him. You know? But I've never worked in a studio with 
anyone, I mean, Mick Wilson is no schmuck when it comes to working in the studio. Mick is an incredible musician. His voice is astounding. And he's a big part of all the harmonies, of course, you know. And, and Damien just has this incredible, unique voice going on. It's like having Steve Perry, Freddie Mercury, and Dennis DeYoung in the studio at the same time. Yeah, so, that'd be about right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think he's, he's brought an emotion, a level of emotion into our songs that surpasses my wildest dreams. But, but, but even, even in um, the cover of, uh, I believe, in Father Christmas the, that we did at the end of last year. I mean, yeah. I was yeah, I got goosebumps yeah. just watching it anyway. But as I was watching it, I kept thinking, because I got, I got used to Damien's voice, I kept thinking, is he going to do that thing soon? Is he going to, like, let go of the <laughs> rail and just kind of go, go for it? And, of course, he does at the end, doesn't he? And it's just he go, it, it yeah. just takes what is a really emotional song that a lot of people from that period, as you say, are, are very aware of life and, and things. And so that song is probably, of all the Christmas songs, is probably the most emotional one of all. And he, yeah. and he dials it up to, to 11 at the end doesn't he it's just um... he, does, he does super dames yeah he can do that <laughs> I, I know I know he works now he works very quick I mean I've never seen anything like it I mean you'll never get more than three vocal passes out of him on any song that we've done wow. some of the one take Seasons Change was one take that take is the only thing we did with Seasons Change I think we we might have done one ad lib at the end drop, drop in as an alternative but we didn't use it in the end so yeah. that season's changes is the only take he ever sang. Gosh. And that's on the album, and that's astonishing in itself. Yeah. So he's, he's just a very naturally gifted singer that whatever key we're in, whatever song we're doing, I just know if the words are right and if he, if he gets into the song, he just has this incredible power to, to do what it's needed. So they're doing the Super Dames on, I believe, in Father Christmas – I knew he'd do it because I knew that the song was low, so I knew that he could go and knock yeah. it up. <laughs> he just, but you, anyone can do, you know, not anyone, but any top singer could start singing high willy nilly for the hell of it, and it will sound rubbish. But Dames does it with a purpose, and he sells it. You no, know, it, and it, it it just works. Did um when Damien was in the band, did, did it change your writing style at all? Knowing you, yeah, you it did. did. It, it allowed me to go right. I'm, I, instead of having a. You know, a 3.2 Jag F type, I've now got the five litre supercharger, you know. So, you know, I, I had the potential to know that the songs that we were going to do we were going to move into a direction that was going to put Cats even further into its own box. You know, we we don't feel that we fit the rock remit anyway, and we never wanted to. You know, we, we're, we are a rock band and we can do ACDC and stuff like that. But because of all this other stuff, that's what bowls my egg. You know, I, I like to do songs that emote, and with Damien, People believe it, you know, and that's, that's, that's the thing. And indeed, the rest of us, you know, you know, Jeff is an amazing singer. You know, Dean is an amazing guitar player. They're not doing this for just a hoot. They really, really put their hearts and souls into their performances. Steve is drumming and his keyboard player. They're all incredible musicians. So when I go into a studio, there's nothing that I have to worry about. It's like, oh, will we be able to do that? If we're going to stack harmonies up, we want to do 100 voices that we have done. We can do it. You know, if we want to do multi-layer Brian May's Till the Cows Come Home, you know, I can do it. You know, Dean can do it. Andy is a phenomenal pianist. So we're very... Very true. You know, I, if I'm going to compare us to Styx as a band or Boston or something like that, they were amazing players that knew they had such good capabilities within the team. And we've got the same, yeah. same you know, proficiency, you know, which is... a which is brilliant. You know, I don't have to push people too hard when we're producing because they're, they're just going to do it, you know. Well, that's it's fantastic because, I mean, there are lots of bands, aren't there, that actually go into the studio and can't wait to get out and they say that they just live for the stage and they can't capture their sound in the studio. But you are you are just, you capture exactly what you imagine yeah. in your mind, don't you, when you write the, hear the music? Yeah, it's a different animal. You know, the, the, I've always said, and again, I'm going to use the Queen analogy because I am definitely in a way, you know, it's... It's it's stupid to go into a studio and unless you're ACDC doing Power Rage or something like that, you know, you're trying to capture lightning in a bottle. You know, we try and capture lightning in a bottle with the actual performances of the takes of the vocals and the guitar solos and the piano playing and, and the drum fills. But we go, we never ever say how we're going to do that live. Not interested because the record is a, is a, is a historical piece that you can play time and time again. And it has to be 
what Cats in Space does. So it has to be big, it has to be produced, it has to have all the buzzes and bells in the world, the kitchen sinks. When it comes to doing it live, we just go, we'll just smash it out live as a rock band and we'll do the three-part harmonies and we'll do the best job we can do, but never do the two cross. We never try and make, you know, I don't ever think, let's do this song, but we better work out how we can do it live. Do it doesn't interest me. At that stage in the game, I'm just trying to make that song the biggest produced yeah. load of nonsense you've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned that you mentioned that the songs are very emotional, but your, your lyrics are very, they're very observational and very humorous in places as well. And they're all, yeah. they kind of, they kind of picture like growing up in the seventies and the eighties uh, and the way oh, yeah. that you see things. Is that, is that something you find really comfortable writing about, you know? A hundred percent. I don't want to write about, you know, what so many bands tend to write about. I mean, I, again, because it's cats in space and I've never had to do this before. You always had to work within an AOR remit of lyrics, you know, where you have to write certain things in, in certain ways. And, Oh, it's just, it just leaves me cold when you think about the song. I, first thing I do is I look at an album of its song titles, and if the song titles look cheesy and just the same old, same old, I'm, I'm not interested in hearing it because I know what it's going to be. When I see album titles with quirky song titles, I'm like, oh, that's a bit of an interesting one. So I've always loved the quirky song title. Mick Wilson, you know, he's always moaning at me. You know, he said, oh, no, not another song about clowns or witches. You know, <laughs> I said, yeah, but I like it. I like HR Puff and stuff and Hanna-Barbera yeah. and, you know, on the buses and all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I come from that era where, you know, it was fun. So if we can write a song like Charlie's Ego, we can because we're cats in space. You couldn't yeah. write that song if you was one of numerous other rock bands. No, no, or uh, they could or, do it. Or a song like Sunday's no. Best. Sunday Best. No, no, they'd never do that. No, because no. it wouldn't be cool. It wouldn't be rock, man. It's not yeah, cool. To, yeah. Oh, we've got to go on in our, you know, in our jeans and t-shirts and and be cool. I tell you what's cool. Cool is being honest and being open and having a laugh and going sod it. Why don't we write a song like that? Why not? You know, Freddie Mercury wrote Ladies on a Sunday Afternoon. Yeah. Roger Taylor wrote I'm in Love with My Car. Ludicrous songs. They were ludicrous, but now they're considered classics because time has allowed them to become queen classics. But even Brian May said, I'm in Love with My Car. What's that all about? You know, so Sunday Best to us is just what cats do, you know, and um, it's our kind of thing, you know, and it's quite funny when we do the, the occasional festival that we do in front of all the beard twitchers that are going, oh, I'm here to see so-and-so, and, -so, and yeah. well, we better see what this Cats in Space is all about. Apparently, they're the best band in the world. Or, and they sit there with their arms folded, and we're doing a song that's emotional, like, I don't know, Marionettes and Atlantis. And you can see them. They, they, they just go, oh, I shouldn't like this, but I don't half like it. You know, they're all wiping the tear away from their eye, you know, while the girlfriend's not looking, you know. And it's like, we'll get you. We'll get you because... If you haven't got any emotion inside you, you're dead, you know. So everyone's got something yeah. that you can emote to. And um, that's my job, you know. That's what we want to do. I mean, I deliberately at the beginning when I introduced you as a rock pop and metal band didn't use the phrase <laughs> classic rock um, because I, I think it, it's – it's. Um, I know I've seen you described as like classic rock band, but you're not. And also I think that phrase kind of puts you in a box that's as if it's something because all the best bits have happened. And I think, as yeah, you mentioned, yeah. you know, it's the rock band. You know, this is the thing. We're just cats in space. We're just yeah, a, it's a rock band. Yeah, I've give, given up on it. I mean, when we started, we thought well, we need to tell people what we're about. So we're a power pop rock band. We're a <laughs> we're a classic seventies infused rock band. You know, because we were trying to let people know this is a little bit of what you're going to get. But once they started hearing it, and people, and the best compliment I got on the second album was uh, I played it to some close friends. They didn't know the songs at all. And they just listened to it and they went, do you know what this sounds like? I went, what is it? Cats in space. So exactly. we're cats in space. We're, we are a rock band because we have Marshalls and Les Pauls and we crank the guitars up to infinity and we got thundering drums and bass and whatever. So we are a rock band. Of course we're a rock band, but we're, we're more than that. We're, we're like cats in space. You know, Queen were a progressive rock band when they came out, and now they're just Queen. They're just a, you know, a rock band. I think uh, that that's the important thing, and it's a bit like thinking back of Freddie Mercury, isn't it? That you know, Queen one, Queen two, Sheer Heart Attack. You know, they were a rock band, and then you know, by yeah. the middle middle of the eighties, you you know, the Live Aid thing. You had people that didn't they didn't like rock, but they liked pop, and everyone liked Queen, and, and yeah. people. That, 
they just were able to bring in people from every every tribe they weren't in a silo they were able to just and they you know and they all wrote you know they're yeah, very they, clever. They yeah, yeah they and the same as I mean, so i can i can see with your your songs especially as we move towards the, the new album that that's where you're heading and obviously damien opened a door for you to take this to to another level you know, yes, so. definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Kickstart really is is a amalgamation of all the other albums that we've done. You know, it's like a, a a melting pot of everything that's gone before it. So it's almost like it's almost a way of top and tailing what Cats in Space is up to now. You know, yeah. we've encaps- encapsulated it with you know epics and loose concepts and crazy pop ballads, etc. Um, the, uh, never do, we'll never do another album like it, that's for sure. But it's, you know, we can't keep in the same place forever because we will end up just rewriting. No, no, no. And, I, and great stories. But at the same time, we still have to be cats in space and deliver yeah. the, quir- the quirky and the lyrical context. I'm, I'm very much nowadays, since Damon joined, and especially with the way we've done the tour and how we've emoted to the fans, we've had people in tears on the tour. Maybe maybe we're rubbish. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think we're that bad personally, but we've had people sitting there while Damien sung "Hero" just on his own with Andy Stewart, and we knew it was going to be a moment. We knew it was going to hit people, and it really did. And I just thought, you know, maybe we need to explore that even more. Maybe the way we're heading is just to do songs where people really, really think, "I need this song as part of my emotional." life if you like you know because when we get miserable we always play certain songs and when we're happy we play certain songs i want cats in space albums to fit into that's music music is the transfer of emotion from one person to another at the end of the day exactly it's so it's such a powerful thing because at the end of the day no matter what's going on in the world especially when covid you know when we came out from that and people were desperate to see it and we did too many gods and went hello just that first hello Yeah, people were back. They were back, you know. Yeah, and it it was an incredible thing to witness because you did, forget Christ. I wrote that song on my dining room table those years ago. You know, okay, it hasn't sold a million copies. It's not the biggest song in the world like Bohemian Rhapsody, but to the people that like Cats in Space, that song, that battle cry of "Hello," you know, it's it's huge, you know, and it's so music emotes way better than anything else and also you know? the the good thing about the current situation with music is that it's in a way it's timeless but the you've written that song but it could be dis, it could be discovered on a playlist in two years from now and take off in a direction you didn't even you mm. can't even imagine you know like um running up that hill by kate bush and just it could appear in a, a soundtrack yeah. or something can just boom because a lot that'd of be nice. you know, <laughs> that'd be nice i could do the prs for that that'd yeah, be lovely I mean, because a lot of a lot of young music fans are, are you know are, are being are discovering music and they, it doesn't say to them all oh, this is from 15 years ago or this is from two weeks ago or this is from the 70s it's just music yeah exactly and I think, I think, it, yeah you know, that's very true that's i think that's very apt of where we are in the world with music um it's like there's kids now saying oh i like that song by so and so it's an absolute banger you know as they call it <laughs> <laughs> and they'll go and download Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. They haven't got a clue that it's off of jazz. They don't no. even know who Queen are. But they've heard that song and that becomes as, as close to them as Taylor Swift or yes, that's rap right, music, that's whatever right. it is. It just slots into the, okay, it's one song, but it doesn't matter if it, if it if it works, it works. You know, I mean, obviously I still want to sell albums to people that want to listen to albums. But if we get one song that goes into people's psyches like that, then great. In fact, we did two shows with Blue Oyster Cole um, a while back. Yeah. And um, it was bizarre because we sold a fair few vinyls on the merch table. 90% of them went to kids that I would say were under 20. Now, that is bizarre because these young, I said, what are you doing here? You're at the wrong gig. You know, have you missed your bus or something? You know, like laughing with them. And they said, no, no, we love rock music. And it's obviously they found rock music in the last three or four years because I was thinking even their parents would be, old enough to be my kids you know so i'll be their grandparent unfortunately you know i'm thinking where have you come from to listen to blue oyster cult so maybe the reaper or something like that was something that they liked and they bought a ticket you know i, I, th- I think so because so i 
I think so. I do a weekly show called Chart Watch where I do some analysis on what's selling and stuff. And um, and some of my subscribers said, well, you know, rumours is always in the charts. And obviously it's going to go back in the charts because of the sad passing of Christine McVie. Mm. But I said, mm. it's not about, I said, when you see that in the charts, I said, it, it isn't like people from our age group are buying it for the third time or whatever, because it's a three cd remaster i said it's mm. younger music fans who who just want that because they know it's a classic album to listen to and yeah. i was in a record shop on saturday down here in truro and I, and it was really busy and i would say the average age was 20 23 to 29 something like that and people yeah. buying vinyl albums and cds so i think there's a there's a urge for a tactile feeling to the music so my my hope is that things like streaming is like the radio you go there and you discover things and you're intrigued to, and then you go off to band camp or you go off and support the artist and I'm, this is important for all of you watching you support the artist by buying the vinyl album and the cd and go straight to the band if you can because you'll get extra merch and signed copies and you'll be connected to the creative journey yeah. of that artist so 100 percent correct yeah i mean you know kids are discovering vinyl now and i've i've, I've been saying this for years and i'm going to blowing my trumpet here because I Go said back in 2008 that vinyl will come back because I'm a big vinyl collector I'm a I'm a you know one of my businesses is is selling classic vinyl one of the things that I do so I, I I've had my handle on vinyl it's never gone away in my world so no no it hasn't gone away I've in my watched, world. yeah and I've watched the cycle come round and I've seen what stuff goes for and I'm involved in that so I'm, I've got a very good handle on vinyl and I see more and more people going back to it, not just because it's a fad, but because it is a, 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 a the credible format. You know, you can't beat the system. At the end of the day, everything goes full circle. And um, and you're right, the music business has changed in such a way. You know, in the old days, they'd press up 60,000 copies of any album just to hope it goes, and if not, they'd chuck them in the bargain bins. You know, nowadays, you can't do that, those kind of numbers. So it's so important that, bands livelihoods rely purely on on their merch the money ain't in gigs and it ain't going to be there next year next year we're doing a theater tour next year oh, yeah. um which we're planning which is going to be kickstart the sun part two it's going to be a two-hour theater show split into two we're taking it to select venues around the country and it's going to be the biggest challenge and the biggest thing that cats and space have ever attempted and it you know and it's something that people probably again will think you're absolutely mad to do it especially in the climate that it is but i said you either sink like a lot of bands are unfortunately i think will do next year because of the way things are or you've got to fly above it and give people something to an experience you know i mean and i use the ramstein analogy people haven't got any money no one's got this no one's got that you hear about it on the telly all the time i'm going to rant now but i'm sorry but now go for it. You, hear it all, you hear it all the time doom and gloom and scaremongering yet in the same breath these people will pay 120 quid to go and see ramstein blow up coventry rico stadium why because it's an experience the whole show is on bloody tape i'm convinced most of that show was tapes mm -hmm. i'm backing it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because you're seeing the biggest spectacle we've ever seen they'll pay 120 quid for that because it's an experience it's a day up those people don't want to go down to pay 10 quid to see a new band on a sticky carpet in a, a rock club because it's just not their bag. It's like, oh, what's the point? I'd rather stay at home. Da, da, da. Spend a million quid watching Kiss, though. You know, So that's the dynamic that the music business have, has got to worry about at the moment, and that is simply the fact that people of our age group, they tend to want to have experiences, and they want to know that they can park their car and they can have a curry afterwards and they can get there safely and yes whatever. exactly totally you don't get that you don't get that unfortunately playing some of these places because it's become so hard and i'm not going to name and shame because i won't do that but we did a few gigs on the last tour recently where our fans just didn't want to be there they came because they wanted to see the band you, yeah. the gig wasn't very well attended because it was clear to me that this place is struggling, not through their fault, but through maybe COVID yeah. or, or whatever the lack of finances or whatever. The infrastructure was all wrong. The gigs that worked were the gigs that were more of a theatre style that had a much stronger infrastructure and therefore they could market the shows and it was clean and it was tidy and people want to go there. 
So we thought, well, we need to put on an experience what people expect from Cats in Space. You know, from day one, again, the problem that we had, which our agent at the time said, your problem is everyone thinks you're ELO and they're expecting to see a 40-foot spaceship come down from the ceiling with all this dry ice and you lot to come out from it and play the O2 at London. Yeah. But you can't, you can't sell 20 <laughs> tickets yet, so that's no good. And unfortunately, I tend to believe that. And as we've gone on, we said, at some point, we're going to have to make the jump and just go, we need to put the show on that people probably think Cats in Space is. And that's going to be a financial, the biggest financial risk we'll ever take, certainly in my life. But he who dares, and we're going to do it. Well, like, it's, foot, we're going to do it, you know? But, it, but it's, you know... Me- Rent over, sorry. Yeah, that, well, people <laughs> people need light in the darkness, and music is 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 a healer. Um, it, it it connects people from around the world. It doesn't matter what language you speak, you can connect to it. But also, where you pitch yourself as a band is how people perceive you to be. So if exactly. you play, if you play like the kind of the venues that are down the back of a dark alley, then people think that's where you are in the scheme of things. So, uh, so and also listening to your music, watching your videos, you you give off an element of where you are. So yes, I understand that why your manager would say people are expecting the spaceship. Um, because 100%. The songs sense, need the space as well because they're big songs. They don't they breathe in small Avengers. You know, it's, again, I'm not dissing these places. I, I'd never do that because we need these places for bands to, to do co- the grassroots yeah. stuff. And I only hope they do survive, but I, I'm, I'm cons- very worried about it because I can see the problems ahead, you know. Yeah. But so you, but you, you know, you need them to survive, and I really hope they do. But cats don't belong there, not because we're no. being snobby and disrespectful, but we just can't project in those places. You no, know? and like you said, we've been six, seven years down the line now. We have to make that jump into where people probably perceive us to be, and hopefully they'll buy a ticket and come and see it. But we will promise them an experience, and we'll promise them the cat show that they've all wanted to see. You know. Well, yeah, but also, yeah, so also because you're not, you are obviously, as you say, you play, you know, Gibson guitar through Marshall Ampson. So technically, you are rock, you're a rock band. But for the mm-hmm. the way that your music comes across to a lot of people, you're a contemporary. You you're you you play music that would appeal to people no matter what genre they think they like. People are going to Absolutely. discover your music yeah. and just say, "I like that song," without Absolutely. even mm. without even looking under the bonnet to see actually what genre it's filed under. They'll just say, "I like Cats in Space." Oh, did you know that they're they're a, they're a metal band? Are they? Um, you know, because it, it, yeah, it's a perfect analogy yeah, like, again. Yeah, it's perfect. If people say, "I just like Cats in Space," why? Well, I just do. I like what they do. It doesn't have to be because we're rock, metal, blues. No, it's, it's just no music. Way. It doesn't it's, matter. It's, it's just, it's like just really, space. really good music. There's one song on um, Atlantis, I Fell Out in Love with Rock and Roll, which is a great video and a great song. Um, that obviously tells a story about your perceptions of how where music was going at the time. What was the what was the inspiration for that? Oof, um, it's kind of a self a biography about me, really. <laughs> I thought I'd write a song about me. Why not? <laughs> As you do, but yeah. it's, it was it was uh, it was a really bizarre thing. I had no qualms about writing the song. I mean, Atlantis was kind of on its early days at that point. And I, one night, I just sat down and something happened. And I remember thinking to myself, "That's why I found out I'm not wrong." I must have said it to someone or something in a phone conversation. Yeah, I said, "Well, that's why I fell out of love with rock and roll." I thought. Fell out of them, but that's a song title, and it immediately yeah, made me think of something like Mott the Hoople, like the Golden Age. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 great band. So yeah. I sat down at the piano, and and this is absolutely true. I normally I will always try and get a song in my head, and I won't go to an instrument until I've got something going on, because otherwise like, you tend to fart around playing stuff that you you know that you naturally go to. So I try and build a song in my head, and then I try and play it. Um, which is, uh, I find a good way of doing stuff. But this time I sat down, I thought, well, I'm going to write this song called I Fell Out Love Rock and Roll, and I'm going to play on the piano something that is uh, another song. I'm just playing somebody else's song, and I'm yeah. going to just take that line in. So I just sat down and, and started playing, and, and I thought, doesn't matter what call comes next, do absolutely a traditional piece of music. So I did this thing, went for all the usual calls, bit of Freddie, bit of little, bit of <laughs> at the end, and that's why I fell out of love, a rough roll. 
the little and I did that twice and I thought and it naturally went up to the, the middle eight bit you know it all comes back yeah. to zero then I went to the, the, the middle and I kind of played this song and I and I knocked it out in about five minutes because wow. I thought well I know it's somebody else's song I know that's something else it's David Bowie or it's Mark Hoover or it's Queen or it's something it just sounded great and all I had was and that's why I came out and looked up and then I worked it worked it back and just said I thought, well, what did I do in the 80s? And I thought, looking back at these photos, I just thought, you look like a goon, you know. Yes. <laughs> what is the hair doing there? Very <laughs> proud at the time, and I'm, I'd never diss it. You know, I, I think they were great days. They were great we were, days. Yeah, well, we were all there, yeah. We yeah. were all there. And, I, and, I just not, and again, because it came from the heart, it came right from my emotive position. These words just tumbled out in about 10 minutes, all Fantastic. of them by one line. And the only line I changed was... Um, I was going to use the, the phrase gated snare because all the drum snares were like, yeah, 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 <laughs> back yeah. in the 80s. But no one would get that in the context of the no, song. No, so no. I changed it to something else. And, um, and this song just fell out. And I remember thinking, this is the best song I've ever written. Wow. In my, in my world. In, yes. Yeah. Because it was really from here. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to do this. And I took it to the studio during COVID with Ian Cable. And I said, I've got this song here. It's called I Fell Out of Love with Rock and Roll. You went, oh, what a title. <laughs> yeah. What's that all about? I mean, well, I fell out of love with rock and roll. And it went through the grunge thing. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. I fell out of love with rock and roll. I fell out of the game because of grunge. Um, I had a publisher trying to get me this big publishing deal. And I had these songs and this album with a band called If Only. We spent 100 grand on this album with Jeff wow. Downs out of Asia. All this stuff going off. And I watched Nirvana come out and kill the game. So I thought, one day I'm going to write a song about them buggers. And, and I did, you know. <laughs> and it is Pound for Pound, along with Kickstart the Sun and Bootleg Bandolero. It's my favorite song that I've ever written. Um, and I love it. And every night we do it. It closes the main set because it has to because it's such a yeah. massively powerful it song. Is. And the yeah, 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 is everyone goes, oh, he's done the old bloody, was it Let It Be or Hey Jude or something like that? It's actually not because um, I'm actually a really big fan of Guy Chambers and Robbie Williams, those I mean, early albums. Quality writing, you know, so you like about Robbie Williams. Those songs are really no, good. no. Do you, do you know on my on my list of. Uh, People you sounded like Robbie Williams is on the list. I just forgot to read it out because yeah. I, I thought there, there's something. And my, my wife Sue um, said the same thing when she was listening to the latest album. She said, she said "Robbie," she said, "You can hear Robbie Williams singing some of these songs." But 100%. that's a good that, that's a good thing because it's uh, any pop any pop performer could p- could take one of your songs and you know and and you oh, yeah. and do it easily. Yeah, I mean, not Island. easily, not easily, because yeah. they probably they wouldn't be able to sing like Damien. But you know what I mean? It's of course they couldn't. Yes, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, Gary Barlow, you know, the greatest day. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. You know, um, was it the Garden? Where it is that? Some of those songs, they are fantastic. But I'm, I'm not a fan of his voice. I think he's exceptionally limited, but he's a great writer in that respect. Yeah. But um, some of those songs are again. How many times they play Montelli and why? Because they emote. Because they connect, yeah, absolutely. And Robbie uh, Williams and such stuff. I mean, blimey, angels. God, well, yeah. I tried to rewrite that with scars. I can't scare you know? <laughs> But I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of those Guy Chambers songs, those early albums and yeah. the production. And um, Phil Spaulding, the bass player, he played on them on the early albums. I, I knew Phil years ago. He did some stuff for me at the time when he was doing those albums. He's I just come back from doing the cut of songs on the Robbie album, knocked yeah. them out in an afternoon, as he does, you know. And he was telling me, saying, they're really good. He said, I'll tell you what, his new album. And it was when he did um, uh, Feel, which is what I think Feel for me is possibly my favourite song of the century. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love, I mean, I like the, the darkness stuff as well. I love the darkness, but feel for me, pound for pound, is probably my favorite song of the century because it's just, it's incredible. You know, it's, it's just, and I love all that stuff and it emotes. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I forgot what I was doing with that, but yeah. That's okay. Well, your, your new album, Kickstart the Sun, I think is is the best thing you've, you've done so far. Uh, and Thank I you. think, as you said, you you writing, you know, Differently because of Damien Bond on board, and a lot of the songs here are like are like these powerful um, ballad. Well, they're not ballads. Ballads would tell some of you out there think, "Oh, it's a ballad," but they're not. They they start like that, but they just build to these emotional mm. kind of um, 
tsunamis <laughs> of, of, pa- of, 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 pa- of power and, and emotion. Well, like um, you know, tsunami, <laughs> like it. Yeah. Um, you know, kicks or oh, kickstart. You know, kickstart the sun. It just builds up into this anthemic rock song, but it's, mm. but it's, but it, it could be, it could be remixed to be like a, just a pop ballad. It could be anything, but it's cats in space yeah. is what I'm trying exactly, to say. Yeah, I mean, we always say let's put the kitchen sink on, which we actually did. Actually, put the kitchen sink on bootleg bandoleros. <laughs> there is a kitchen sink on that track, and I yeah. swear we got we got we got evidence of me actually recording. Yeah. Some bells that I dropped underwater into a stainless steel sink to get this yeah. special effect. So yeah, but I've always liked. I mean, songs that just go along like that. You know, I mean, yeah, some rock songs and some pop songs they need to do that. You know, get them start to finish, put a key change in, lovely, lovely. But for me, the songs, the classic songs, the big songs that people have got in their arsenal tend to be songs that build and build. You know, even ACDC flows about to rock. You know, DC it stuff. Yeah, yeah, it built, yeah. Flat out, straight across the line on the red, finished. But even some of their stuff built, you know, and I've always wanted their songs to be, otherwise it's like you go around Verse Bridge Course twice and you put a solo in and it's like, especially nowadays, people think, oh, I'm, I'm done at one minute 50. You don't need to listen to the rest of it because it's it's been said and done. Aha, uh-huh, not with cats because there's no. going to be something else going on. Yeah, and that was, so, uh, that, the track I just mentioned yeah. is a perfect perfect example. But also, yeah. the, if, even you think about like Disney soundtracks or movie soundtracks, the way that these, there's always an epic ballad in there, you know, the, whatever. Your, your songs yeah. have got that kind of feel to them. And of course, A Million Miles, is like um, a just a, a, a it's kind of well it's sort of a cousin to Who Wants to Live Forever by Queen. It's that kind of epic feel. Right. And this you've got like two versions of this. There's the one on the album, and there's the one with uh, Julie McGuire on. Well, how did how did that come about? Um, well, again, early on in the process, we I mean, I I wrote the piano part of Million Miles um, and sent it to Dames. And I had a kicking around for a while, actually, but I just couldn't get it finished. So I kind of sent him this thing, and he sent me this track back. He did that in Kickstart Sun, funny enough. And he sent back this, uh, uh, da, 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 that opening verse. And I just sat here listening to it going, what the hell? This is amazing. And he just did the whole thing on his, on his phone <laughs> and sent this little demo back. And I just went, oh, God, this is brilliant. Took it to the studio. Said to me, right, we're doing a, million, a song called Million Miles. So. so there's me on the piano playing badly as always. Go, don't worry, Andy, you'll play it better later on. And we've, I said, listen to this, though. This is me and Damien. And he just went, wow. It was just Damien and my badly played piano with the 90% of the arrangement in place. And we just knew straight there and then it was going to be a, a big, big song. So we did the demo. And as the demo went on, um, Ian took it home one night and was doing a bit of work at home on his laptop with it and he came back and he went I can hear this big duet I went do you know what I went home last night thinking I could hear someone like Meatloaf from Bonnie Tyler doing this as a duet I went right we're doing it as a duet as well I said but we'll do two versions one with Damien and we'll do one with Damien and we'll, we'll ask Judy Maguire because Damien works well with Judy because he's Work with her in loads of those shows. They've known each other for donkey's years. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and Julie really wanted, she loves the cat, so she wanted to come down and do some backing vocals anyway. Fantastic. So I said, Would you fancy doing the lead vocal? Um, and it was only going to be a bonus version. Um, so she came down and smashed out this duet, and they were both around the mic as oh, well, wow. um, just to get the vibe, you know. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. Again, pff, two or three takes, it was done, and it was just off the charts you know and we just said this is an oscar winning performance you know so we just made this song get bigger and bigger and bigger and um also at that time we knew that we had um did we know was james involved in? i can't remember but we had james heron our video man we said if this comes becomes a single then it's it's got to be a really good video as well um yeah, all your videos yeah, are fantastic they, yeah. found, they find their own legs you know these these songs in the studio this is why i love the studio so much i go in with this little skeleton idea and it might be me and stevie around his house with his electric drum kit and me just playing on the guitar yeah. just to get a format down and i take that into the studio and we start to put the proper beds of the arrangement down and even at those early stages we're just going we know where this has got to go because we we know what Cats in Space does now, you know, and same with me and Mick Wilson. We just take these little thin skeleton songs 
and then we, as we say, we build the beast, you know. And as we build it, they get more and more exciting, and we start putting more and more stuff on them. And we just go, this has got to be bigger and better than what we've done before. So, yeah, Million Miles is a, again, it's an, another astonishing vocal. It's, but it's also a fantastic musical piece, you know, the piano playing and, you know, check out Jeff's bass playing throughout the album. You know, Jeff's bass playing is amazing. He's like John Deacon and Chris Squire combined. You know, he's he's a phenomenal. And he brings an awful lot to the party. You know, when you listen to Cat stuff, the bass playing really does pin down what we do, you know, a lot. You know, Steve is drumming. I mean, what a drummer. I mean, he's... I, I, I think the the musicianship in Cats in Space is phenomenal. And, you know, all the bands yeah. that I kind of said I could hear amongst some of your songs is because you are all of all everybody is connected you're all you all belong you said at the start that this is like there's a special magic between you all it is 100 percent. yeah i mean i i'm you know as producer my job is to get the best out of them and to boss them around and have hissy fits and shout at them you know which we don't do very often to be honest no, we, we, no. because we, we we totally know what we're doing you know and um you know i'll say to jeff it'd be like it's Deakey on this one, isn't it? He went, yeah, I'll get the precision out, and he does John Deacon. Or, you know, we don't ape them and emulate them, but he's got that in his box. He can play finger style like John Deacon would, you know? Or I'll say to Stevie, I'm listening to Cozy Power on this one, mate. Just go blood and thunder. And he goes, yeah, okay. And, it, and they go and do it. You know, they do this stuff. And Andy will do his Bobby Crush, all that's kind of crossing the hands business. Or he'll do, you know, whatever whatever style... We always give a nod to Phil Lanzon, actually, at Uriah Heap, because he, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. he was in Grand Prix back in the day, and I'm, I'm a huge Phil fan. He's a good, he's a good he's a great player. Great player. We've met several times, and I really like Phil. He's brilliant. Yeah. Um, but I love what he did with Grand Prix. So I say to Andy, bit of Lanzon on this one, bit of Lanzon or a bit of Elton, you know. And yeah. these guys can do it. You know, they're brilliant players. So the songs find these legs that it's so exciting to to – to watch and i just love being in the studio watching that magic materialize you know there's another track teenage millionaires which is like a great video um and that's obviously about social media um and people are almost becoming like pseudo rock stars on social media just by doing whatever yeah. they do How, what what's your kind of what does the band's relationship to social media because it's one of those things you you need to use now as a as a modern band isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Stevie wrote the lyrics for Teenage Millionaires, um, so it's very much his thing, you know. I mean, he's got his own take on it, of course, but it is that kind of TikTok generation and social media becoming what it is. And in fact, I was just having a conversation before about this. Um, you know, part of me could gladly walk away from all forms of social media and never darken its doorstep again. But oh. the other half of me whores it because it's our business too, you know, and... and You'd be foolish to think that you can you can't use it, you know. So you have to whore yourself out on on Facebook, which I do alarmingly too much. But it, it's it is so necessary, you know, necessary I should say. But I hate it. It's a double edged sword. I hate it, and I just find I find the whole thing very bizarre. I always have done. People airing their personal lives on it. But I'll tell you what, though, it's been the best thing for songwriters to be able to use it as as a yeah. a, a topic. You know, Mad Hat's Tea Party. Yeah, that um, that comes from it. I've got a song that I'm writing for the for the new album that um is is very 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 much about a sinister side of what people could do on on social media. You know, people can stalk people without them even knowing yeah. it. But yeah. the the, the, the the alarming thing is so many people will put stuff up on, on social media to attract attention to themselves and then the minute it goes a bit wrong they start moaning about it you know and yeah i'm thinking well hold on a minute you're posting up hundreds of pictures of you with barely any clothes on you are going to get by the law of average many men around the world scrolling through your Facebook profiles looking for those pictures and you don't know they're doing it because they're not leaving any likes or no. clicks or whatever. This, it's very sinister, very dark and mm. very damaging. And I find it alarming that millions and millions of people do this every day. Um, but it's become part of our lives where it's almost like we just have to do it. And I really respect people that don't do it. I really do, but unfortunately, well, if you're in a if you're in a band, it's kind of 
you need it you like ability, don't you? Yeah. It's like it's like having Sounds magazine, Kerrang, and you know metal hammer whatever having it at your disposal every minute of every day oh, yeah. because you can keep giving well, people information out. back in the day you just have to send your pr you know your press release into kerrang and hopefully they can fit it in next week's publication yes and if it, if it doesn't go in you've missed it out you know you missed the gig guide or you yeah. can't have a photo in because there's no room nowadays you can do all that if you yeah, do it right very, so very true Double edged, double edged sword, but and and so it's yeah. come to the uh, to end of the interview now. But uh, the other thing about that's the social media, and obviously you you're going and putting your stuff out there. On the other side with social media, you have a lot of um, rock fans of us uh, have grown up through the the golden age of what they of rock music, and there's lots of Facebook groups where people, um, you know, are all, all rock fans, and they're kind of reposting the same update saying, "Oh, it's the anniversary of Led Zeppelin two coming out," or this mm-hmm. person passed, and and they'll be saying things like, "This shame, there's no new bands anymore." It's all the the, the whole focus is on the past, yeah. and and the thing is that there are new rock bands, and they're they're kind of hiding in plain sight. Cats in Space yeah. is a good example. Do you was there when you start the frustration that I think you mentioned about playing a festival and the people sitting with their arms folded, thinking, "Who's this?" You know, come to see the yeah. main, the main legacy band, and there are you. Do you have you felt this? It's been difficult to break through to traditional rock fans. Yeah, from that period? yeah, yeah. I mean, when we was on tour with Status Quo, we stormed it. We actually went down, you know, brilliantly with the Quo fans. Most of them never heard of us. They got their grand grandson or whatever to put it on YouTube so they could look at us before we went on or whatever. But most of them aren't there, and they've not come back since. We've always said our Facebook likes didn't go up by 10,000 after doing the, t- the quote or yet we played to 10,000 people. It's because they're not on social media because they're of an age where they don't want to. So you have to go out into the fields and get them another way, which is <laughs> for us through the theatres and through the theatre brochures and that kind of avenue is where those people are because they just don't want to do social media. No, no. They want to be a Cats in Space fan, but you need to get them on a, an old-fashioned mailing yeah. list, you know? Yeah. So there's still that avenue of the of the, of the the business that's there, but it is now like you've really got to work hard to go and get them. So, again, that's another reason why we're going into theatres next year is because we know that we'll sell tickets through the theatre brochure and we've got all their infrastructure of marketing. Of course, yeah. To get to these people, yeah, and there's a, I believe that we've got twenty percent of our fan base on social media. I think we've got eighty percent of it still out in the fields that we haven't got yet. Yeah, and yeah. you can spend a lifetime getting them, but hopefully by keep plugging away and doing interviews and keeping out there, the word filters out, albeit slowly. Yeah. You know, social media and the rock thing on that is tough. You know, it's it's. It's so quick and there's so much stuff out there. You can get forgotten about in an instant. So it's a constant thing. But I do believe our market is out in the fields more than it is on social media. Yeah, yeah. And you, you're D- Dean Howard, you're, you're the guitar player. You you two work so well together. Do you have similar influences? You mentioned that Thin Lizzy is one of your favourite bands of all time. Is that yeah. kind of... Does does Dean yeah. have similar influences? Yeah, Dino's a big Joe Walsh fan, and he loves um, all that kind of old seventies stuff. You know, he's 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 his own player in many ways. Dean is he? You know, he loves Rick Nielsen from Cheat Trick. Obviously, we're big Cheat Trick fans. Yeah, um, yeah. Dean, you know, I always say Dean's a bit like Mick Ronson, which he he was oh, a great player. Big fan. But he naturally has that kind of style, and he's got that seventies feel. It's like oh, he can do two notes, which yeah. you know I, I wouldn't be able to do. You know, he just has a good guitar player. Just has something, and you don't know what it is. And I think those two notes you just played—they're so simple, but I yeah, it's do the feel. It's the feel, isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We work very well together, so we have yeah a lot of our influences are very much the same. We certainly don't lock heads over guitar parts. He does say to me sometimes, "Oh no, Gregster, you put all those Beatles chords in there. I don't want to do them." I said, "I'll do the Beatles chords. You just do those little cheeky lines over the top." Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Wait, and, it's it's part of the magic. It's part of the magic of your your compositions and the music and the whole band of cats in space. That you said that when you write the music, you're thinking about the emotive side of it. That all of you as musicians connect that way. So as like the, as you said, the, you know the bass, the drums, the, all the the, the the harmonies and those absolutely gorgeous vocals. Mm-hmm. But as you say, the guitar parts, everything serves the song. There's nothing. 100%. Yeah. It's always about the song. Always. Yeah. It's never about anything else. 
is you play for the song, you give the song the respect, and if you do that, then the song's got half a chance of being decent. Yeah. When the bands release albums, you say half it's crap and half it's good. The crap stuff is not because they're not playing for the song, and there's nothing there to grab hold of. You know, yeah, you've got, to make, you've got to make yeah, you've got to make stuff that you want to grab hold of. And you know, we work stuff really hard. I mean, we don't just knock it out. We do take a long time to do it. But if the base of the song with Damien's voice and me on a bad piano. If I know that's what it's going to be, I will get to the end result yeah. because I know what it's going to do. And I know that I've got the team that's going to do it with me, you know. And like I said, they, they're they also super respectful of what we have to do. You know, it's it's a very lucky format that we've got, you know. Um, and it works well that way. You know, we don't have too many cooks boiling the broth, as it were. You know, a lot of the time it's yeah. me and Ian Capel beavering away doing bits and bobs you know but when the guys come in and we all play it's brilliant and, and magic happens you know as cat weasel once said yeah and and do it do any of the songs take on a different uh arrangement live i mean do or yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> simply yes yes because we go there's 55 guitar parts there dean pick one <laughs> will you uh what will i do oh, i'll do that one yeah. so but like i said we said doesn't matter we just rock it out yeah. and that's and a lot of our fans say we love. It. We've got to do a live album because we love the rock versions of "Poke the Witch" and yeah, you know yeah. "Start the Sun" and all that stuff. Yeah. Because like, they are really just basically balls to the wall, powerful yeah. songs. We do them live, which is exciting because we can get a different element into that. Yeah. You know? So we don't we don't beat ourselves up too much over. It. We just go, well, we know the three part harmony is the strong point. We know that the drums and the piano will do that. Andy does for code, he uses a vocoder, which is, you know, that ELO thing, Mr. Blue yeah, Sky. Yeah. We use that a lot. That's one of our signature sounds as well. And we just create this wall of noise, which we can do live. And people's brains fill the gaps in. Yeah, like Queen, yeah, yeah. You fill the gaps in. Um, so it works well, you know. And, yeah. and it's, yeah, we definitely want to do a, like a live, a proper live recording of the show because some of those songs live just kick ass. Yeah, that would be, fan- be fantastic. Now, you've got it's some, like, You've got some live gigs coming up before Christmas, haven't you? We have. We've got um, we've got the Swansea Patty Pavilion on the 16th of December. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the Stables in Milton Keynes on the 17th of December, which is going to be an amazing night. That's the first time we're doing a two-hour theatre show. That's the, oh, this is the acid test. Yeah. Yeah. This is the dry run. So we're going to be doing a two-hour show there, two one-hours. Or it's a two show, two show. Yeah, it might not yeah. be quite two one hours, but it'll be two sets. Yeah. And then we go to the garage in London on the 18th of December. And then that's the end of part one. And we see everybody next year when we'll announce what goes on for part two. But you've also got um, quite a lot of uh, merch, Christmas goodies, haven't you, To for for fans to... We dig. have. Yeah, there's loads of stuff on the website. If they go to catsinspace.co.uk and go to our merch store, there is a cornucopia of availability of merchandise there. It's like going on to the sale of the century behind the curtain, you know. It's full of stuff. There's the, there's a box set of the singles. There's a calendar. There's beanie hats. Beanie hats. There's, yeah, yeah. There's some, there's some of the old stock there. We've still got some, you know, some of the uh, the other albums. I will say that obviously too many gods is sold out and deleted these days. We won't. We'll we plan to do something with that later on, maybe. But Scarecrow is now looking very very thin. That's that's almost all gone. Day trip to Narnia, Atlantis. You know, there's. T-shirts, we've got old tour T-shirts, we've got a few of those left. As I said, it's a cornucopia. Go on the website and spend some money because that's what will keep us on the road next year. Exactly, and uh, that's very important to everybody um, to to support artists who create this wonderful art for us. Is to buy and buy a vinyl album, buy a CD, buy a T-shirt, buy a beanie hat, buy a calendar, uh, box of singles, and of course that's the single uh, million miles, isn't it? Million um, miles, yeah, and it's signed as well. So we've got a signed version. There's a five gold rings box set. There's only very few of those left because they've sold really well. Yeah. But there's loads, there's loads of stuff, but. Yeah, I mean, and our, we do pride ourselves on very high quality product. You know, the you know, gate folds, there'll be booklets. They're all, you know, lots of stuff is signed. Yeah. They're all limited editions. You know, we it's it's all top draw stuff. You know, obviously there's all the artworks from Andy Kitson, our art, resident artist, who does all that all that stuff. Um, you know, we sell loads of the artwork, so it's a it's a whole store. You know, it's it's grown into another arm. You know, in fact, all Fantastic. the other bands on the road would say. You guys doing the merch, you are the blueprint for merch. I mean, yeah. I know yeah. I know we are, because yeah. that's what puts us out on the road, because it ain't the gig money that does it. That's for sure. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I saw the video on on YouTube of you going through the the merch. That's why I thought I'd have to mention it because it's it's so imaginative and um, it's great selection yeah. of stuff for fans. Yeah, we got mugs. We got you can get yeah. coffee mugs. Yeah, we got loads of ideas. There's so many more things. I'll bring out a pinball machine one day. You watch. Yeah, you yeah. Watch. Well, oh, that'll be that'll be awesome when it cats in space pinball machine. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time, and uh, wish Absolute you all the best pleasure. for 2023. And um, I'll, obviously, please keep me informed of what's going on and. Uh, I'll, I'll check out the website and I'll, I'll make sure I share everything that you're up to. Um, yes, so thanks, thank Greg. You. And um, thank you very much. And a very uh, Merry Christmas to all your readers and listeners out there. And yeah, don't forget, come and see our last three gigs in December. And we'll see you next year on the theatre tour. It's going to be good. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Greg. And I'll see you soon. Yeah, thank bye-bye. you. Thank you for watching and listening and a special thank you to my guest Greg Hart from Cats in Space. And remember, you can order the band's albums, singles and tons of merch directly from their website in catsinspace.co.uk. And don't forget to check out the Now Spinning magazine website, nowspinning.co.uk, for our latest videos, reviews and podcasts. And I look forward to seeing you on our next show.